Uh, my name is Lance Ball. I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat and the functions architect for OpenShift serverless functions. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Lance Ball, and this is Mauricio. I'll let him introduce himself. Yes, so my name is Mauricio Salatino. I do work for VMware. I'm 24-7 there on Gnative, and I'm super excited to be working on the functions project we Lance. This is exciting stuff, so I think that we can just crack on, right? Yeah. And before we start, uh, we build the game using functions, and, and that's kind of like what we want to show today. So I will quickly show you how the game works, because we will be playing together at the end of the session. So we want, we want, I wanted just to show you how kind of like the interaction goes, because it's going to go fast. And if you want to play and get some points and you know, get some swag, uh, you will need to understand how it works first. So the first thing that we do is we just create a player name, and then we play. And as you can guess, we are going to be playing through a set of questions. And each question is going to be basically triggering a new function as you might guess, because we are talking about functions. So when you start the question, you need to know that there is like a timer up here that it's going to run out. And you will score more points if you go fast, right? Like you just need to pick an option there and just move forward. As you can see there, there is some code start. Then you just get the answer from the next level. And there might be questions that ask you to do different things. But the important thing of the game, something that will happen at the end of the timer there, is that you will be able to tweet the scores. And also, we will be kind of like using a hashtag in Twitter. Uh, just to you know, score uh, different participants and you know, and just track who is playing, and I will be using this through KubeCon. So you know, at the end we will be doing some raffle and, and just getting some swag. When things work and the internet works, there will be a Twitter button there. That's where you can tweet. So we will be playing together at the end of the presentation, and I will be also talking about how did we build this game and how this game is kind of like evolving. Lance, okay, you go next. Go for it, man. All right. Uh, okay, so that was the quiz game. Um, so uh, brief agenda, we're going to talk about why we did this project, why we did this project on Knative, talk a little bit about the characteristics of function projects. I'm going to do a very quick demo just to kind of show you what the developer experience is about when you get started using functions. Uh, and then um, uh, Mauricio is going to talk a bit more about sort of more advanced function patterns and then show you how this game is architected uh, and then how you can extend something like this to go even further. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk a little bit about our roadmap and plans for the future. So why do we uh, talk about functions? Well, functions are um, really the single responsibility principle on steroids. When you think about single responsibility principle, usually you think about microservices, where you have some sort of object like a, an order, and then you've got a set of services that can create, update, delete this order thing. And that's a single responsibility. But the truth is, that's, there's a lot more going on there, right? As an application developer, you have to open up your network connections. You have to be listening for operating system signals and that sort of thing. Functions sort of narrow all of this down to actually just a single responsibility, and that is your business logic, right? Your function receives some input, has some output. That's it. And that's all you have to think about as a function developer. So much so that uh, these functions are meant to be very portable. There's no dependency in the code on Knative itself. So if you write a function in, let's say, Node.js, and uh, you package that up as a module, you can deploy it as a function on Knative, but you could also use it just as a, a module in some other application somewhere else. They're very independent and portable. We provide some pretty powerful tooling. Uh, 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 function CLI, as well as the ability to extend that CLI with what we are calling language packs. And there's a contract to extend the sort of capabilities of the func CLI that way through language packs. The main thing for us is developer happiness, right? Making it very easy. Knative already makes it really easy for developers to get started on Kubernetes. This just takes that one step further. So why do we do it in Knative? Well, first of all, it already makes things easy for developers. And I like to think of functions as sort of the, um, the programming model and Knative as the deployment model, right? So these functions, in theory, could be deployed any number of places. Right now, Knative makes the most sense because it's Kubernetes-based, it's containerized deployment, and Knative, Knative serving provides all the things that you need in order for you to receive like HTTP ingress, right? Incoming HTTP connect connections are handled by Knative serving. You don't have to think about it as a function developer. And then in more advanced cases, when we're talking about reactive type of functions, we get uh, Knative eventing involved 
valve where you can get uh, events coming in through Kafka or RabbitMQ and those flow through the Knative eventing system through channels and triggers and brokers and that sort of thing, all in the form of cloud events and the functions uh, that we, we support uh, are, are, can be invoked that way reactively via cloud events as well. Um, the characteristics uh, of Knative functions are, um, are this. We've got a handful of, of languages that we support just out of the box. So to get started, you can write your functions in Node.js, uh, no Go, Python, Spring Boot, TypeScript, Rust, Quarkus. Quarkus. Um, and like I said, you can extend that. So if you're a, a, a vendor or a, a, you know, like a, a large organization, a large company like, say, American Express, and you've got a bunch of uh, dependencies that all of your developers use in all of their projects, you can use a language pack to sort of customize the developer experience. We don't have a lot of time in this, uh, in this presentation today to get into the depth of like language packs and customizing, but it is a really neat feature, and if you're a vendor or, or a large organization, you might want to look into that. Um, we support a couple of different build strategies, uh, uh, S2I and build packs for the local experience for the developer on their laptop or pushing to like a development cluster or a staging cluster. And then, of course, you don't want developers pushing code directly to a production system. You want to have that part of a CI CD pipeline. Uh, we also support that through Tekton. Uh, typically, your functions are going to be stateless. Um, if you do need to store state, you're going to do that in some sort of external thing like Redis, um, and we'll see that yeah, today. Yeah, we'll see that, yeah. Uh, and um, and I, like I mentioned earlier, um, there's a couple of different ways that these functions can sort of uh, react to things imperatively through just sort of standard HTTP invocations as well as, as, well as reactively through um, cloud events. So. I made it through those slides pretty quickly. Um, I'm going to show you a, a quick demo of, of what the uh, developer experience is meant to be like for uh, functions. This big screen. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Um, okay, so we have, uh, in addition to everything I've mentioned, we also have a plugin for VS Code and IntelliJ, and it's a little rough around the edges. Um, this is all pretty new stuff, but I was really excited to show it off to you, so I'm going to try and use it today. Hopefully everything will go okay. Um, so the first thing I want to do is create a function. I can do that through the plugin. It prompts me for the name of a function. I'm going to call this viewer. Uh, because basically every function out of the box is just an echo function. So we're going to view some cloud events. As you can see, we support all these different runtimes. Node is going to be easy to demonstrate, so we'll do that. And let's look at cloud events since this is a CNCF event. Uh, and I'm going to create this in my little demo folder here. So I create a function, and it asks me if I want to add to the workspace. I will do so. And now you can see over here on the left, um, I've got a, a project that looks pretty much like any other Node.js project. Um, I've got an index.js. This is where my function lives. Uh, and as you can see, this function is what? Like less than 40 lines of code. Half of it is <laughs> comments. Imports, yeah, yeah. And then we've got this dependency here on cloud events. Um, I, I mention that because I want to point out that this is very much like any other Node project. So like I can update, change dependencies. I happen to know that the invocation framework here, FastJS runtime, has is, is been bumped to 0 0.90. So I can do an NPM install, and it'll easily just bump up my, you know, my dependencies. Uh, there's nothing sort of unusual about this project in any way. Sorry? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Let's fix that. <laughs> There we go. Um, so yeah, uh, OK, so uh, the vulnerabilities are gone now. <laughs> um, now, uh, the, the next thing I want to do is show you sort of what it looks like from this Knative plugin. We can see now that I've got a function here locally. Um, I can do a func deploy and do it in verbose mode, and it will use Pecado build packs to create my function, make it bigger. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. 
Um, yeah, so we, we're using build packs to build the function, and now it's pushing my, it's already created an OCI container image. It takes that container image, puts, pushes it up to a registry. In this case, it's pushing to quay.io, and uh, yeah, it should already be. I hope I didn't control C that. Um, and now I can uh, run func invoke. And no, I can't. I have to go into the directory, the project directory here. And from the project directory, I can run func invoke. And it will send an about event. How about func run? I can run it locally. And then func invoke. Send a cloud event to my function. It'll, it might, the func invoke knows if my function is running locally or if it's running in the cluster. If it's running locally, it'll prefer that because that is the sort of developer inner loop, right? The developer inner loop is I'm gonna make some changes to my code, I wanna build it, I wanna test it. I wanna build it, I wanna test it. And speaking of testing, the other thing that we have is the ability to um, all of these functions have come out of the box with at least basic unit tests. So there's a test directory here. We've got unit tests. And we think of functions typically as being unit testable. And you don't really need to do integration testing. You can, I suppose, if you want, when you've got a bunch of different functions together. But a single function, its input and its output. So unit tests are sort of the, the way, uh, the, the name of the game here. So just func test, uh, no, sorry, npm test, just like any other NPM or Node.js project. Uh, so as a developer, and I'm showing you Node.js, but obviously we have all these different runtimes. As a developer, your developer experience is gonna kinda just be like any other developer, uh, any other experience that you have for that given runtime. Uh, you don't have to think about YAML. You don't have to think about containers. Uh, it just works. I'm gonna hand it over to you now, so. Thank you very much. show the really cool stuff. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> let's do that. Uh, so yeah, and I guess that part of the, the presentation here is to show what the project can do. And uh, you know, like building functions, it's a different programming model. And that's why I wanted to quickly go over like the interaction patterns here. I don't know if you can see my screen now. Nope. Yes. Loading. Loading. All right. But I have like, again, the same thing. Yeah, there you go. So basically, um, as Lance men mentioned at the beginning, we have like different interactions. So we can just do like synchronous interactions using HTTP. Uh, and there are like different patterns. And I'm pretty interested in this because the more uh, advanced functions that we build, the more patterns that we will discover. And that's why, uh, that was the main reason to build like a more like large application to start showing this in action. So as you can imagine, you can like do an HTTP request and then just execute the function and forget about it, like function will do something, probably store data somewhere, and then you can move forward, or you can just be waiting for some results from the function. And most commonly, because the functions are stateless, you will be needed kind of like to connect to an external state to read or, uh, or write data, right? Uh, Knative is taking care of the auto-scaling, like scaling up or based on demand and based on requests, and also scaling down, and also buffering the request when there is no instance of a function. That, but that's pretty nice for developers. You, but you need to be aware that that's kind of like the behavior when you're building functions. So whatever you are doing inside a function, you need, to be, you need to know that the platform will automatically scale it up, and at some point, your function might be completely downscaled to zero things that you need to have in mind to, uh, when you build functions. There are some other interaction patterns that goes more into the async space, like asynchronous interactions, where you might contact like a, you know, a function and the function will need to do a, like a long batch process. And these kind of like mechanisms where you know, they are going to post the results somewhere else, so you need to kind of like understand how to go and fetch those results or have like a channel to be able to get those results back to the application. And then we move to the cloud event-based uh, space where you can have functions that are going to react based on events. So basically consuming an event, like reacting when an event happens, and then emitting an event as a result, which allows you to go and chain functions together, right? Like one function can consume the events that other functions are producing, and then you start building these more like event-driven applications. Or you can mix and match all the things that I mentioned before. You can have like HTTP-based functions emitting events and then notifying other functions to do some other stuff. And this is actually how we build the quiz game that I showed you at the beginning. 
The application that we built, it's pretty simple, but as you might know, like as soon as you start going uh, building something that needs to work and that we are all going to be playing together, things get complex. And for this application, we try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, like the application is built like with that idea of each question in the quiz game, it's a different function. We have created a different function to deal with every, every request. And we are storing a state in Redis, right? And as you might think, this in this case, because we are doing all synchronous requests, uh, we will need to take kind of like the latency, you know, into account to make sure that, you know, our application can react and can work uh, correctly for, for all the users, right? Like if we have all this room playing at the same time, we will need to bootstrap this and scale up these functions uh, for that to, to work. There are different ways of doing this. We've done it in this way just to test this, this, this approach, this synchronous approach, and then we extended it with events, and we will be seeing that in action. But what this makes, uh, like what this diagram is showing is that we also have like an orchestrator in this case. So if you have synchronous interactions, you will need to have some component that has the logic on which function to call next. And in this case, that's kind of like the game front end that we have in there. And then we have a React application on the other side. There are some challenges and some good stuff about this, uh, that this building applications in this way, right? When uh, I do not, I haven't been using functions for, for a long time, and now when I switch to build this application, it's pretty interesting how you need to change, you know, like the, the mindset on, on the things that you are going to put there in the function so the platform can take care of all this, like, upscaling and downscaling. Uh, so uh, definitely you need a game, like an orchestrator in this case that I, I mentioned before, and that's the only reason, because you need that, the, the only reason why you need that is because you need to coordinate which functions are going to be called and in which order. We need to take into account the latency, and you will see that the first person playing this game will need to wait for the function to get started, but all of you will need to wait for Redis to write stuff into, into the database and to read data from it. And yeah, and another thing to take into account when you're building these kind of applications is that if you are connecting to a database and your functions are going to be scaled up, you might start hitting kind of like bottlenecks on the database if you, know, if you run out of connections, because you will have lots of replicas just trying to connect to the database. For that reason, we decided to also add some like reactive uh, stuff on top of this application. And in this case, we are using Knative Eventing to deal with cloud events and route cloud events across different components in the application. So each level here, like every time that you are working, like answering a question, it's going to emit a cloud event to a Knative broker, that this, this kind of like cloud events router, that it's going to send you know, the events to the front end, and we are going to use our, our socket to send the events back to the client side which is pretty nice, everything is cloud event based, so we are routing events even to the front end, like even to the client side code that it's running into your laptops, uh, and that's pretty cool, I think, like, because the programming model, again, it's all the same, and it works like kinda nice. And going down, double, doubling down on what uh, Lance mentioned before, uh, I really love the idea of, um, of having kind of like functions written in different languages. Oh, sorry about that. I just want to mirror my screen, and I cannot do it from here, right? There you go. Let me mirror my screen so I can see what I'm talking about at the same time. This place. I don't know why, for some reason, like it was mirroring before. Now it, it is not mirroring again. Now it's mirroring, I guess. There you go. So what I wanted to show is like quickly two functions that we have here, like one in Go. Again, the same thing that uh, Lance built, but now using Redis and connecting to a database. And what you can see is that we have just a single you know, entry point for the function. This is kind of like, how are we going to invoke the function once it's deployed? And then, you know, again, like, simple, like, like typical developer stuff in Go, we are connecting to Redis, we are storing some data in there, we are emitting some cloud events from here. And the same thing, uh, just to prove the point, we have built different levels using different languages. We have another function written in Go, uh, sorry, in Spring Boot in this case, which is pretty simple. It's following like Java conventions and Java function interfaces which is pretty nice because, again, if you're building functions in Java, that's pretty much what you want to use. You can, you can like, import any other Java function and just expose it as a Knative function pretty easily. Again, same thing, we are connecting to Redis, we are connecting, uh, emitting cloud events, all using kind of like the libraries that the language provides. Both projects were created with Funk, as like Lance mentioned, so this is pretty like, nice and, and pretty straightforward, no matter in which language are you working on. And I think that we don't have any limitations of adding new stacks there, so. Like, if you're interested in a language that it's not there, we can definitely add it. Uh, to finally, uh, to kind of like close that, uh, when you're building with, uh, you know, uh, functions with events, uh, you definitely need to take it into account that now you're building async communication, so eventual consistency might be a thing. 
uh, because we're using cloud events, that basically means that when I'm in Spring Boot or where I'm in Go, I'm using the Cloud Events SDK just to create and read Cloud Events. And that's pretty powerful because, again, there is no technology stack kind of like locking. You can choose whatever you want and then produce and consume Cloud Events or create HTTP you know, requests in any language. And, and yeah, and that's kind of like very interesting because you can start extending your like synchronous applications with reactive stuff and start like adding on top of the things that you already have, like those, these more event-driven features that I will be showing in the game. Before we go and play together, let's talk a little bit about the, the roadmap, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so really excited to announce um, that uh, Knative Functions is now sort of a full-fledged working group. It began as a task force, and as of this week, I think, uh, we're actually a real working group. So Whoa. yay, very exciting. Um, everything is happening very quickly. Uh, things are maturing. We're trying to keep everything backwards compatible uh, as much as possible. Um, you know, some things might be changing in the next uh, month or two with the new yeah. func.yaml format. Um, we want to improve our on-cluster build capabilities to be able to support multiple uh, build strategies aside from just build packs on the cluster. Uh, and then dynamic templates, which... Uh, we are thinking about it. Yeah. We are thinking about that. Yeah. Uh, that, that that's, we don't need to get into that right now. Um, and we're going to continue to build out the plugins for VS Code and IntelliJ. Uh, and then uh, these external template repositories are basically examples of the language packs, and we're going to continue to build that stuff out as well. Very excited about what's going on here. Yeah, definitely. Around like those templates, as you can see, like if I'm building a lot of levels for the application, they are all built in Go or in the Spring Boot, it makes a lot of sense to have this external repository where you can put templates that will make your life easier as a developer, and Funk allows you just to point to these repositories and get started with something that it's not like a very, like, a very empty you know, shell for a function. So I think that it's time to play. If you open your phone, you can go there. Uh, I think that there is something missing in the application that it's reporting issues, but we will probably be adding that if the application fails. Wait, oh, you know, this is, you can get it there? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so if you open the application, uh, you will be able to start playing there, and you, can, you will go through five questions. What I want to do while you are open the application, I, I see everyone playing already, so I will just switch to the dashboard here that basically will show me who is playing uh, live, I guess? Let me see. There you go. Let me see if I refresh this. I have no internet. Are you oh, no. kidding me? Sorry, what? <laughs> oh, no. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Look. I need to pay for it. <laughs> no, but I don't have internet. How can I pay? No, are you kidding me? <laughs> All right, this is Cloud Native. Thank you very much. And this is how we fail live. <laughs> there you go. There's oh, you yeah. Go. Okay, let's see. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> you can see, but at least people is playing, right? Like some people managed to get into the application and they are playing. Look at that. We have like 24 people playing. 25 now, 26. That's pretty cool. There you go. So we will be looking at the, you know, at the, at the scores and, and then sharing some, some prizes with you folks. But that's pretty much it. Uh, one of the things that we want to do with the demo is just to share, to share it so you can run it on your own environments. That's work in progress still, but you know, feel free to get in touch with both of us and I guess that we will be sharing more stuff. Yes? One, one question? Sure. One question? Go for it. Somebody have a question? Anyone in the audience have a question? They are answering questions now. I don't think. Question? I think we'll have time for that. maybe 36, one or two. 36 people. That's good. Yeah. Damn it. That's me, so don't do me. <laughs> so we put some Easter eggs in the question, so I don't know if people notice. Hi. Thanks, thanks for the talk. This is your Scrum Week of Arctic Finds. Um, cold starts are <coughs> actually a big thing with this. Uh, can you elaborate a bit with the different language packages? Are, is, like, I know Quarkus can compile natively, which prevents a cold start due to like sub milliseconds, but can you elaborate a bit on the other languages supported? How cold starts can be uh, managed or should be managed? Yeah, do you want me to answer that? It's yeah, about cold starts. I didn't really hear cold, yeah. cold starts and how they can be managed and based on languages and language functions? Yeah, so it really depends on the technology stack, right? So if you are using Quarkus, as you said, like if you use VM, like the native compilation, you will have a fast, you know, cold start because 
that's kind of like what you're doing. You're compiling natively, so that will start fast. In Spring, we have a Spring Native. It does the same thing. You can just do the same thing. In Go, it's pretty fast all the time because, again, it's just compiled. So it really depends on kind of like the language that you're using and the technology stack. You should, as a developer building functions, definitely take care of that in some way or another, and then just making sure that your functions can bootstrap it quickly so you know the platform doesn't wait for too long. Yep. We have another question. Sure. We might have a cold start talk later in the day. Cold also. start later, yes. Um, hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, wondering what architectures are supported. What was that? Uh, like system architectures. Does it run on ARM kind of thing? System architectures, does it run on ARM, uh -huh. PowerPC, S3090X, wink wink, um, the, x86? The Funk binary runs on uh, ARM, AMD, x86, 64, I'm trying to think what else, I think that's it. That's it, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and then uh, the, the, the builder images, the build pack builder images, I think right now there is not an ARM64 builder image, but hopefully that's coming soon. That's, we don't produce those, we're using Picado builder images. Um, although it is pluggable, you could use your own if, you, if you've got an ARM64 builder image that, uh, that you like, it's pluggable. It's on Picado build packs. Yes. I think we we'll have more questions. We we'll have a question. What? Okay. So one yes. more, and we finish to give time to the next speaker. Oh, hi. Oh, okay. Cool. Sweet. So I noticed that you'd mentioned that there was no YAML associated with uh, using your uh, function tool. However, I did see as part of your uh, directory or the file breakdown uh, something called func.yaml. That's correct. Uh, what is that for? He he said it, not me. So that's metadata like for the function itself. And so there is YAML in the project. Um, we, we try to hide that, or not really hide it, but it, the user doesn't have to interact with that. And in fact, a lot of the values in here you can set using the func CLI. So we have a func config command that you can use to do things like set environment variables on your function. And those environment variables may be pulled from a, a persistent volume or secrets or from something uh, in your environment you know, itself or a hard-coded value. Um, and that kind of stuff is hidden, the, the YAML is hidden from the user through the, the things like func config. Yeah. Or especially Kubernetes YAML, right? There's no Kubernetes in this no, YAML. No, yeah, exactly. And the idea is that you're not using kubectl apply. We are just trying to hide that away from, from the user in this case. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So thank you, Maurice and Lance. Thank you very much, talk. folks.